Bonfire night used to be my favorite day of the year. I mean, awesome history aside, what's not to love about a national holiday that's centered around a bloke getting burned alive as punishment for a failed bombing? There was something about the whole toasty bonfires and spectacularly colorful firework displays thing that just captured a kind of youthful excitement in me. Me and my mates would wrap up warm, get a few hot dogs and burgers going on the grill, smoke up to make the fireworks display extra colorful, if you get what I mean, then stand around a bonfire getting toasty, while downing cans of lager to get a different kind of toasty feeling going. But a few years back, something hideously unexpected happened that left the time around November 5th filled with bad memories and nightmares, something that I don't think I'll ever really get over, no matter how hard I try, because honestly, it's mostly my fault. So it's the morning of the 5th of November 2016, and it's absolutely pouring down. What we'd normally do if the weather looked terrible was nip down to the field we'd usually build our bonfire on and pile up some old dead wood and whatnot, then whack a tarp over them. That way we'd have firewood to stack to build a bonfire and the night wouldn't be a washout. That year, we'd had a gander at the weather forecast for that week and although it promised to be incredibly chilly, there was no rain forecast which I suppose just makes us divvies for having believed it in the first place. Point being, we had absolutely nothing in the way of firewood stored up and ready to use, so we were in something of a jam when it came to how we'd get our yearly bonfire going. But with bonfire night falling on a Saturday that year, I'd had plenty of time to be able to remedy the situation. All I needed was to get out to the field as quickly as possible with a few choice tools in hand to make a start on salvaging what had become a much-loved yearly tradition for us. I arrived at the field at around mid-afternoon, having gathered up the supplies I needed. In the boot of my car, I had a tarp, a broken-up wooden pallet to give me a little of the dry kindling I'd need to get the bonfire going, and one other thing, a large plastic can of petrol. I hauled them out of the boot and into the field, then got to work. It took me a few hours to assemble a large enough pile of wood to make a decent bonfire, and most of it was well too sodden to really be of any use, but that's where the petrol came in. Every so often I'd soak the wood in a few lashings of the highly flammable liquid, letting it absorb as much as possible. The logic being that by the time it came to light the bonfire, there'd be enough saturation and heat to dry the wood out and cause a lasting bonfire for us to drink around. Then, just as the sun started to set, I sent a group text around to the usual lads, letting them know that I'd saved the day and that the bonfire was good to go. I was something of a hero that day, and we went from assuming the evening would be a literal washout to jumping on the hype train. Those yearly bonfires started as a bit of fun, but as we got older, they were a way for us to keep in touch as careers and relationships got more serious as changing nappies and weekends with the in-laws came to replace the stable afternoon pub sessions. So as darkness set in, one by one, my mate's cars began to pull up in the lay-by by the field. We were all hugs, back-slapping and catch-ups, helping haul deconstructed BBQs from boots, carrying coolers full of beer and burgers into the open field while waterproof jackets kept the drizzle at bay. Once the food was sizzling away on the grill, we started to set off a few fireworks. Whoever could bring the most spectacular firework has become something of a wiener measuring contest over the years, but it made for an excellent show while we wolfed down hot dogs and corn on the cob. But the bright flashing explosions of colored gunpowder quickly lost its novelty, and so we turned our attentions to the great pile of drying wood in the middle of the field. I was still manning the BBQ at this point, so... It was two mates of mine that approached the bonfire, dousing it in the last of the petrol I'd bought as another one of our number dolled out the tins of lager. Then come the fateful words. Ready, lads? Here we go. I turned to look in time to see one of the boys leaning in to toss a piece of flaming newspaper into the pile. And then the whoosh and flash of flame that followed blinded me for a few seconds. I covered my eyes instinctively, feeling the heat of the fire on my face from all that way away. Then when I had covered them, 
it wasn't just the bonfire that was alight. It was one of my mates. It was honestly one of the most horrific sights I had ever been unfortunate enough to witness. An actual human torch, arms waving with screams of burning agony echoing around the field. I think he was too panicked to actually do the whole stop, drop, and roll routine. He just tried to run away from the flames, seemingly unaware that it was his clothes that were actually on fire. It took one of us running up to him and shoving him into the wet grass, screaming at him to roll around to put the actual flames out. I watched for a moment as the body of my mate actually lay there smoking for a moment before the screams of call a bloody ambulance actually got me to react and pull my phone out. Perhaps the second worst part of the whole ordeal was trying to get an ambulance out to a field in the middle of nowhere. Not only were we in a fairly inaccessible part of the countryside, but it took far longer than was ideal to actually get emergency services out there. Meanwhile, my friend had suffered burns that extended pretty much from head to toe, and was in a ridiculous amount of pain, judging from the gut-wrenching, mewling sounds they were making. I don't think I'd ever have truly forgiven myself if they died of the burns, but then again, I've not forgiven myself in light of their survival either. Their body is now a mess of burn scars, even with all the skin grafts they went through during the 18 months or so that followed the accident. From what I could gather, it wasn't the oversaturation of petrol that caused the explosion of flames, but the fumes that had become concentrated in the core of the bonfire. Once a flame was put onto it, it acted sort of like a mini fuel air bomb, the heat and pressure of the fumes expanding to engulf anyone that was close enough. And unfortunately for my friend, the waterproof clothing he had on at the time was dated and not flame resistant, so he'd gone up like a candle when the intense heat and flame had washed over his body. He says it was no one's fault, sort of blames himself actually for being so close to the bonfire, but I know whose fault it was. It was mine. It was obviously my fault that he'd suffered life-changing injuries that night and I've never really lived it down, no matter how much he tried to assure me otherwise. So like I said, that's how my favorite night of the year became something I dread, because every single year without fail, the memories of that night overwhelm me and brings on the most crushingly depressive episodes. I can barely leave the house around that time of year because without fail, Seeing a bonfire or hearing fireworks just brings back the most vivid memories of that night. Even burning wood gives me the shakes. So please, be very, very careful with your bonfires this year. And every year, because what's assumed to be a bit of festive fun can turn into a nightmare which haunts you for the rest of your life. I've never really been into history. I'm more interested in the natural world than stuff that happened before my time. But last autumn, my dad gave me something that he'd been keeping hold of that would spark off something of an interest in the First World War. It was the 11th of November, Armistice Day, when my dad walked into my room and handed me a small leather-bound book that looked like it was a hundred years old. But I suppose that's because it was, in fact, even older than that. He told me to be very, very delicate with it because it was a family heirloom and incredibly precious. The kind of thing that could easily find its way into a museum one day, but instead we kept it as a close reminder of how our family had a close connection to one of the most horrific events in world history. Before that, history was something of an abstract concept, something that dead old men did that had little bearing on my own life. But in that moment I realized it was just as flesh and blood as I was, that since my family had a deep connection with it, that it was just as much a part of me as it was for them. My dad explained that the little book was a diary kept by my great-great-granddad, who had fought with the Northumberland Fusiliers in the Battle of Ypres during the First World War, and since it was Armistice Day, that it was a perfect time for me to get acquainted with it. But as I said, it wasn't just an account of his experiences in World War I. 
It was a record of how he had been present at one of the darkest episodes in the history of humanity. I'll type out what was written down by him because I feel like this is definitely something you should all hear. It was the 22nd of April 1915. Just after dawn this morning, the Germans opened up with a very heavy torrent. It was a lot of rifle bullets at first, pinging over our heads as he got down in the trenches. But then we heard the machine gun fire kicking off too, this clacker, clacker, clacker of the bullets whizzing over our heads. We didn't know what they were trying to hit. All that fire seemed like a waste of bullets, and despite all the racket, we actually laughed at how we seemed to have been sent to face a division of blind Germans. But as it turned out, they were all part of their horrible plan, to get us as low down in the trenches as they could, to be fodder for what came next. Once the fire had pettered out, I took a little look over the trench to make sure that there were no German stormtroopers rushing our trenches to toss bombs inside. But just before I did, I heard the strangest noise coming from no man's land, like a kind of sizzling you might expect to hear from a pan of frying bacon or the like. Then when I finally looked, I saw something that made my blood run cold. It was like a yellowy-green wall of mist approaching our position, thick and heavy, almost clinging to the ground it rolled across. And it was ginormous, at least twenty feet up in the air. I really do mean it was like a great wall approaching us, there was absolutely no escaping it. We had no earthly idea what it was that was approaching us, but it put the fear of God into us regardless. I suppose because of fear of the unknown is as natural as human beings as eating or drinking. When it began to roll over us, that's when men started to choke. I started coughing and spluttering this thick mucousy saliva cascading from my lips. My eyes burned and my nostrils did too. Any bit of exposed, fleshy skin the stuff touched turned to burn horribly. I didn't quite see it at the time but some men tried to escape the cloud of death by lying down in the trenches, which was definitely not the right thing to do, as it was heavier than air and concentrated near the ground. Those who tried that were suffocated where they lay, snuffed out by something we had absolutely no understanding of. We had no form of protection from it. All we could really do was wet out handkerchiefs in the muddy water at the bottom of the trench and put it over our mouths, same as you do to stop yourself inhaling smoke. We were ordered to hold our position at first, but after a few minutes, even the officers in other parts of the trench more badly hit than us started to run from the gas. In the end, we too escaped the trenches and ran back towards the mine and road. There, you could see these chaps just laying there gasping for breath. There had to be thousands of them, as far as the eye could see, and they were dying in one of the worst ways imaginable. But worse for us was that we had absolutely no idea how to alleviate their suffering. It was so confusing that one of our sergeants took this big jar of Vaseline and started applying it inside the throats of some of these poor young blokes. It didn't help, of course, but I think the point was to help him feel like he was doing something, anything to help the poor buggers. And my God, the state of them. They were swelling up. Swelling and changing colors, they asphyxiated on their own lung fluid, just rows and rows of men turning purple and blue before they died. Some others that had only breathed in a little were desperately trying to drink muddy water from ditches at the side of the road, but didn't do them any good. It just made them sicker. Our eyes were streaming with tears, burning like the devil, but luckily for me, I could still see. There was nothing we could do for those that were blinded, but they needed some kind of comfort, something to at least give them an idea that their wounds could be treated. All we had were rolls of bandages from our first aid kit, which we carried in the corner of our tunic. So we unrolled the bandages and wrapped them around the heads of those that were blinded before we marched back towards Ypres for treatment. I was put at the head of the column of ten or twelve blind men, each with a hand on the shoulder of the man in front. All you could see around you was columns of blind men being led back from the front lines. It was truly haunting. But perhaps the most haunting part was that, on our way back, we marched near the riverbank. 
It was there that I saw hundreds of bodies floating in the water. Men had gone down into the river, trying to drink the water to soothe the burning in their throats. They then died in the water because of the bloating effect of the gas. They just floated up to the surface and started floating downstream. It was a river of bodies, and it's an image I don't think I'll ever forget as long as I live. I have to go roll call soon to see just how many are left, but I don't think there are many left at all. God help those of us that are well enough to carry on the fight because I know we'll have to face this new and terrible threat again, and soon. That's all there is in that particular section of his diary regarding the Battle of Ypres, but I sat there and read it in one more sitting, totally engrossed. I had no idea I had a family member that had been involved in something so utterly terrifying, something that I think would have driven me mad if I'd been forced to witness it. Reading that diary was more terrifying than any Stephen King novel I've read because I know it was real. I knew the river of bodies was actually a real thing and not drawn from the imagination of some dumb writer. After that, I couldn't stop reading about World War I, knowing my great-great-grandfather was a part of it. A lot of it is pure horror, but nothing disturbed me as much as reading about the first gas attack. I'm sure you'll all agree. Being subjected to that sort of new and terrifying technology would have truly been hell on earth. The morning of September 23, 1904 was marked by gray, ominous clouds that blanketed the skies of Cincinnati, Ohio, and it was raining at around 10.15 a.m. when the principal of Pleasant Ridge School, Thomas L. Zimmerman, rang the bell for morning recess. Zimmerman figured a little rain wouldn't do the children any harm as they scattered into groups and began games of baseball and partook in general tomfoolery. But the principal had seriously misjudged how fast and how strong the rain would come. And not just the rain either, a full-on storm was quickly approaching. A few minutes later, the wind picked up while a heavy rain began to fall on the schoolyard. Most of the children ran for the school building to save themselves from being soaked through, but a group of about 30 young girls made a break for the outhouse on the opposite side of the schoolyard. The outhouse was a 10-foot square framed building positioned over a 12-foot deep stone vault on the eastern side of the schoolyard. It was only 11 years old, but had to be repaired several times because of shoddy construction. It was designed for maybe only a handful of students at any one time, but... On that day, just over 30 young girls were trying to squeeze into the cramped, dank space. Suddenly, and without warning, the floor on one side of the building, rotten from years of moisture, gave way, and the entire floor of the privy crashed to the bottom of the vault, taking all 30 or so of the terrified young women with it. The floor fell almost 8 feet vertically and completely shattered, sending children as young as seven into a huge pool of sewage water that was around four feet deep. There was no crash at all, 12-year-old Elsie Ferguson later said. There was no noise whatsoever. The floor just fell. That's all there was to it. Not a child screamed that I'd heard. I felt the floor going and jumped quickly, clutching to the side of the door. I was left hanging on it and... With all my strength, I pulled myself up and out of that place. A handful of the other girls managed to escape the same way, climbing up onto the toilet seat to make room for the others before making it to a doorway. But not all were so fortunate. Raw panic ensued, and the tragic accident quickly became a battle for their lives. The girls were unwittingly pitted against each other in a struggle for survival as they tried to climb out of the four-foot-deep pool of human excrement, with the weaker girls crushed down by the stronger peers as they were forced under to drown in the mass of filth. You see, a mass drowning is perhaps one of the darkest, most horrifying things a person can experience, because during a panic like that, survival mechanics in the human brain kick in, and a person will find any kind of leverage at all to stay above water. 
This means that people will literally drag each other underwater, climbing atop each other's drowning bodies in order to stay afloat in breathing air. This is exactly what happened during the tragedy that day. Girls were actually drowning each other in a desperate bid to stay alive. A young woman by the name of Lorena Ferguson was rushing into the outhouse just moments after the floor gave way, stopping dead in her tracks when she saw the horrific scene below. Seconds later, she turned on her heels and ran back into the schoolhouse to fetch help. A few minutes later, two of the girls ran into the room and exclaimed that a girl had fallen into the vault. Principal Zimmerman later told a local newspaper, I didn't realize the awful calamity that had overcome us, but hurried in the direction of the outbuilding. On the way, I met a number of others. They were screaming wildly at the top of their voices, and it was some time before one of them could compose herself sufficiently to explain what had happened. Another young woman ran to one of the high school classrooms, which was still in session and alerted one of the teachers there of the outhouse's collapse. And then she and four high school boys bolted toward the outhouse, arriving at roughly the same time as Principal Zimmerman, but nothing could have prepared them for what they were about to discover. The sight of terrified young women scrambling up the walls of the collapsed outhouse covered in human filth was almost too much to bear. Others further down were literally swimming in weak old fecal matter, struggling to keep their head above the mass of excrement. The sight alone was bad enough, but the cacophony of screams was almost deafening. All of the girls were screeching at the top of their lungs, their cries intermittent with the sounds of gagging and retching. Two young men were across the street in the Presbyterian church with a few others when they heard the terrified screeching of the girls running away from the outhouse in the pouring rain. As they exited the church to see what all the commotion was about, they began to hear the faint screams of the girls trapped in the vault beneath the outhouse. They heard the desperate screams of Mama, Papa, help us. Then, without as much as a word between them, the occupants of the church ran out into the rain and over to the girls' outhouse. There they found Principal Zimmerman, standing in a narrow doorway to the outhouse, looking half mad with anguish, pale with panic and unsure what to do. The men shoved him aside and got to work. They began calling out to any nearby to fetch ropes and ladders, anything that could help them fish the girls out from the pile of human waste. Simmerman himself dropped to the ground near the open doorway, trying as best he could to reach some of the girls with just his arm, but it was impossible. They were way out of reach. Then some of the men who ran to help grabbed him by the legs and lowered him further down into the recess. This helped him rescue three of the girls before any rescue equipment even arrived, and probably saved the man a lifetime of guilt in the process, given that he had panicked so awfully in the initial stages of the rescue attempt. Especially given that the step ladders brought over for the school were far too short, and the ropes brought over were nothing but clotheslines which snapped uselessly as the girls attempted to climb up them. While I was waiting for a longer ladder, Zimmerman later said, I begged the children to be quiet and brave, and I would rescue them. Some of the older girls followed his commands, attempted to calm the younger ones, but it was no good. Panic had well and truly taken hold. The ladders and clotheslines repeatedly failed, and the rescuers were forced to rethink their strategy. Using quick thinking, one of the men climbed into the steeple of the nearby church and unfurled the rope off the church bell. This was much more effective a tool and helped save the lives of two more of the girls. Another one of the rescuers found a long ladder in a nearby barn and helped Principal Zimmerman dip it into the muck. It was not long enough to reach all the way from the bottom of the vault, but it was long enough for Zimmerman and some of the other men to descend and lift the girls out of the mess. The girls that were pulled out of the mess were almost unrecognizable. Their eyes clenched tightly shut as they wept hysterically, gasping for breath and trying to uselessly clean the stinking waste off themselves. The struggle down there was terrible, said a survivor named Hazel Senor in the aftermath of the disaster. As long as I could get out of the water and take a breath of air, I felt sure of being saved, but when I fell back into the hole, I thought it was over. 
The girls about me were grabbing onto me. Everyone grabbed at each other, and when we did get a hold on the wall, it was only for a second. I caught hold several times, but when I was pulled at by the others, my hand slipped. There was only a few taken out when I felt something under my feet. It must have been some little girl that had drowned. All the time, I prayed. I said my prayers over and over. I could not see after a while, and as I was praying to the Lord to save me, I found the rake in my hands. When I came into the light, I saw Principal Simmerman. I crawled up and was lifted out. After struggling in the violent frenzy among the pit of disgusting fecal matter, 14-year-old Edna Gurky again found a purchase among the brickwork and made one final attempt to pull herself out. Far above me it seemed somebody was coming down a ladder and called to me. Suddenly someone took hold of me. I looked back over my shoulder and saw the agonized faces of my friends, then lost consciousness and knew no more until I woke up in the schoolroom surrounded by the bodies of my friends. Gurky's arms were horribly bruised and torn up by deep scratches. Wounds, she said, were down to the clawing attempts of her classmates to climb over her out of the stinking mess of filth. The rainstorm ceased not long after, but the break in the weather did little to relieve the chaos that was unfolding on the schoolyard. A fair few of the girls passed out not long after emerging from the sewage, adding the fear that they had succumbed to the terrible fumes of the cesspit they had fallen into. But thankfully, neighbors of the school offered up their homes as treatment centers, with rescuers carrying girls to the safety of houses where they were revived, cleaned up and comforted after such a harrowing ordeal. After Zimmerman helped the 19th and final girl off the ladder and watched other rescuers carry her away into the schoolhouse for treatment, he leaned inside the shattered outhouse and peered into the dark, silent cesspit. All he could see were broken pieces of outhouse floor floating around in the surface of the foul water. As he realized the task was over and the adrenaline began to fade, he could have easily fallen into the cesspit himself if it wasn't for other rescuers coming to check on him. But then it was early afternoon, and the sun had finally broken through the clouds, shedding an oddly warm light on such a horrific scene of chaos, filth, and death. The gathered mass of onlookers and rescuers doubled as relatives began streaming in from downtown Cincinnati. It had taken only an hour or so for word-of-mouth accounts of the fatal collapse to reach the wider citizenry. When they heard the news, Pleasant Ridge residents who happened to be working downtown ran back to the village, where they were met with the sight of the frantic children and mothers of the victims, who were congregated in the front of the school. Many of the girls were vomiting blood, and a local doctor in attendance was not sure if they would survive the afternoon. Frantic confusion continued for several more hours as more and more people arrived from nearby villages. Although most of the girls who crammed into the privy lived in Pleasant Ridge, the routes between the school and the train stations were crammed with people. The village telephone system proved inadequate to keep up with the demand, and hundreds of people crowded around every available phone, waiting to find if their daughter was among those affected. When the adrenaline rush of the rescue abated, Principal Zimmerman and his teachers sobbed along with the parents who lost their daughters. Local medical staff looked at the exhausted and emotionally distraught principal and ordered him to a house across the street to rest. One of the doctors remained there the remainder of the afternoon, suffering from a severe headache brought on by the tension and the hours he spent inhaling the noxious fumes emitted from the caked bodies of the drowned girls. On the Sunday morning of the drowned girl's funeral, every church bell in Pleasant Ridge rang continuously from 9 a.m. when the first funeral started until 4 p.m. when the last of the four girls buried that day were put to rest. Four school friends of Emma Steinkamp, the first victim to be buried, had been tapped to be her pallbearers. The girls were bearing flowers dressed in white as they walked alongside but after carrying the tiny casket to the front of the German Evangelical Church, they were too grief-stricken to carry on any further, so four local boys took over instead. The reverend of the Methodist Church tried to calm the sobbing crowd, but one grandmother fell weeping against the small casket, and Emma's mother fainted with a deafening shriek. At that point, 
Two of the girls in white became hysterical and their parents carried them from the scene. The entire town and a fair portion of the rest of Cincinnati followed the hearse to the cemetery. It had been the most horrifying, revolting tragedy in the entirety of Cincinnati's recent history, one that the townsfolk would never forget, and the deaths were made all the more terrible by the fact that they had occurred in a pit of human sewage, a fate that no single person could ever deserve, let alone an innocent young girl. So, many years ago, before the magical invention of cell phones, we used to wear these things called pagers strapped to our hips. For those that don't know, the way they worked was someone would page you with their phone number and you could call them back when you got to a phone. Given that I worked as an on-call technician for a company in the audiovisual field, my pager would go off like all the time. And like most people who use pagers around that time, our clients knew that if they followed up their number with a 911, that would indicate to whatever technician that was on call that they had to stop whatever it was they were doing and call them back right away. Side note, it didn't actually have anything to do with emergency services, it was just like a little code meaning that the situation was an emergency. But although I was always busy, I rarely if ever got 911 codes popping up on my pager. On one afternoon in late October, I'm working down in Florida, traveling from Orlando to St. Petersburg via Interstate 4 when my pager goes off with a number I don't recognize, but one that was also followed by a 911 code. So naturally, I find the first exit and then pull into a little truck stop looking joint just outside of Plant City with the intention of finding the nearest payphone to use. This takes maybe only four or five minutes tops as there are plenty of places to pull into that general area. I park up, get out of my truck and walk into the place, asking the clerk for some change before I head to this wall where there are like maybe six or seven different pay phones to choose from. I pop a few quarters before proceeding to check my pager, dialing the number displayed on the screen and obviously excluding the 911 code. It rings, and it rings, and it rings, but no one bothers to pick up. Now, this had to be the first time this has ever happened, as like I said, that was an emergency call, which usually meant some live music venue owner was in dire straits with some faulty sound equipment or something, and my services were desperately needed. So, there I am, thinking to myself, what is this, who would page me with a 911 code and they just not bother to answer their phone? It's right about then that I notice another ringing sound in addition to the one in my ear. So I pull the headset away from my ear only to notice that two of the phones over on the other end of the wall are ringing from receiving incoming calls. Now to this day I'm not quite sure why I did this but I hang up my handset having gotten it into my head that the person that needs me is somehow calling one of the other pay phones even though like I said it's two of them that seem to be going off. But as soon as I put my phone down, the ringing from the other payphones stop altogether. So as you can guess, it was my payphone calling the other payphone, and maybe the other one was going off on coincidence. That was the closest thing I could figure. But here's where the story starts getting seriously weird. I walk a few paces over to the other phone, pick up the handset, and check the phone number printed above the buttons. You guessed it. It was the same number that I got on my pager, but my head was so fried from the whole thing that I had to like double and triple check the numbers before I finally got through my skull what was going on. Someone had used that pay phone to call my pager from the exact same truck stop I had opted to pull in in order to call them back. There was no way they could have known I was going to do that, right? It was pure coincidence, maybe even some sort of technical glitch, but... It seriously put the zap on my head. I then walk over to the girl at the counter and politely, if not confusedly, ask her if she saw anyone use the payphones that I had been using the past 10 or 15 minutes or so. This time it's her turn to look all confused, before telling me that I was the only person in the store in the last hour. I pressed on her, explaining the whole thing with the phone call coming from the payphone, but she just shrugged it off, telling me that 
Sure, there could have been someone using the phone, she just happened not to notice. Some help she was, but this was pretty late at night, so I don't blame her entirely for not being so observant. So the story had gotten weirder, but now this is where it gets downright scary. I get back in my truck, still pretty freaked out from what had just happened, then drive off about 10 minutes down the highway before I see something truly awful. I mean, it's like a missile had hit the highway or something. This huge seven-car pileup involving a tractor-trailer that was hauling a bunch of scrap metal or something. There were state troopers and paramedics all over the place, with dead bodies lying on the tarmac covered in white sheets that were stained with red blood. I slowed a little to rubberneck for a second, contemplating how, if I hadn't have gotten that pager call, that it could well have been me lying there on the tarmac, dead as a doornail. The timing was just too perfect. From a place I was heading in the direction of, none of it made any sense at all. But it somehow made too much sense also, if that makes any sense. Jesus, I can feel myself weirded out just thinking about it all these years later. To this day, I have absolutely no idea who called me off of that payphone, or why. It had to have been a wrong number, a technical glitch, or some other perfectly rational explanation for what had happened. I don't believe in the supernatural, I don't believe in fate, and I certainly don't believe my mom's explanation that it was my guardian angel or whatever, but one thing is definitely clear to me. If it wasn't for that mystery pager call, I could most definitely not be alive today writing this. Okay, so as far as I know, conquer fights are something fairly unique to the British Isles. So allow me to take a moment to introduce our American cousins to a great British pastime. Conquers is a traditional kids game here in the UK that's played using the seeds of horse chestnut trees, which are nicknamed conquer trees or conquers respectively. Every year, come autumn time, kids all over the UK go out collecting these conquers hoping to find the biggest, thickest ones around. Once they've found a decent-sized specimen, or one that happens to have a particularly acute edge to it, they'll usually soak it in vinegar to make it tougher, which are referred to as seasoners where I'm from. Then, with their seed weapon of choice threaded onto a piece of string, two kids then make turns trying to smash their conquer into their opponents, until one breaks, when the bearer of the intact conquer is declared the winner. Now obviously it's a pastime that's dwindled in popularity in recent years, and I get why. No need to bother braving the autumn cold and rain when you can stay inside and best your mates in FIFA. But Conquerors was dead popular when I was a kid, and it's generally considered to be some wholesome harmless fun. Only I wouldn't say it wasn't exactly harmless, as a game of Conquerors ended up being one of the scariest events of my childhood. I know that sounds mental... You'll see what I mean in due course. So the story starts with me winning a conquer fight in school, against a lad who had this undefeated conquer. There was a whole buzz about this kid's conquer, how it was like the strongest conquer ever, and it would take a true behemoth of a conquer to break it. I happened to be lucky enough to find this oddly shaped conquer with a particularly sharp edge, basically like a pyramid shape, which happened to be the ideal shape to break bigger, rounder conquers. So I harden the thing up, take it to school, and challenge him to a conquer fight. Word got out at registration that I'd challenged him, and there was a huge buzz the entire morning, with the hype slowly building until lunchtime when the fight was due to take place. Now, I know this all sounds incredibly sad, and it was, but we were in all-boys school, and without the calming influence of girls, the place was basically like Shawshank. When the time of the fight came, a huge crowd had gathered to watch, and after a few decent strikes with my sharp-edged conquer, the champion's mighty conquer cracked into pieces. It wasn't so much because I had some super conquer or anything, but more like that the champion's conquer was so weakened and brittle from so many battles that it was only a matter of time before someone came along and knocked him off his perch. A huge cheer erupted from the crowd of pubescent boys and I was basically the school hero for like a day. 
but the former champion was fuming. I'd humiliated him in front of pretty much the entire school, and naturally he didn't take that well at all. The following week, word got around that the former champion had gotten himself a conqueror that would help him to reclaim his crown, and so a rematch was set and the hype began anew. Only when it actually came to battle the kid, it seemed like he wasn't so much interested in destroying my conqueror as he was in destroying my knuckles. You see, generally speaking, kids would swing at each other's conquers with like a diagonal arc as to avoid smashing each other's hands in the process. But this kid's first swing at me was near vertical, and his new conquer smashed into the back of my hand so hard I actually yelped in pain, while the gathered crowd emitted like a collective wince and groan. The former champion assured me that it was an accident, but he had the kind of smile on his face that let me know that it was anything but so he gives me a few token swings to kind of show that he's taking the fight seriously, then aims another swing right at my fist that's holding my conquer out before me. Jesus, the sound it made when it hammered off my knuckle was unreal, and the pain that shot through my hand was enough to have me holding back angry tears. But like I said, all boys school. To cry in front of them would be a fate worse than death. My hand is shaking when I give him what amounted to be a final warning. Hit my hand again, and there'd be trouble. The crowd admits like a oh sound, excitedly anticipating violence like it wasn't funny at the time, but in retrospect it makes me laugh how bloody animalistic boys can be. Anyway, the former champion repeats the cycle of making a few token swings of good faith, then once again aims a full-powered swing right at my fist. Smack. The pain of him hitting the spot he'd smashed previously was absolutely insane, like I thought he'd legit broken my finger at first. I just snapped, the red mist descending as I waited until he was positioned to receive my next swing, then aimed a proper powerful arcing blow right at his face. My conquer plows into the side of his head with a smack that seemed like it echoed around the playground and again the gathered crowd howled in a collective show of painful empathy. I thought I'd just taught him a bloody lesson, showed him how hard it hurt, but to my horror, I watched the former champ's eyes roll in their sockets before he fell back onto the concrete playground with a thud. My stomach dropped as I watched a little pool of blood begin to collect on the ground beside his head. I'd split his face open. Right near his eye where the bone is nearest the skin. And his eyes themselves. Good God. They were just white slits shining out at where they were rolled up in their sockets. Kids screamed, running in all directions. I should have stayed to help him, to try to fix my mistake, but I'm ashamed to say that I ran too. It was just a gut reaction. I was young, stupid, a kid who knew he'd done something horribly wrong, who couldn't handle the repercussions. Like I legit thought the former champion was dead, that my conquer strike to his head had just killed him in an instant, and that I'd kicked off a process that'd end with me going to prison for the rest of my life. I was so scared of what I'd done that I ran home from school, just straight up escaped during the chaos that followed. But I didn't want to go home. I couldn't face it. I knew that's the first place the police would come looking for me once it was discovered I wasn't at school. I remember hiding out in a park not far from my home, just hiding in a bush and imagining all the things I'd never do in life because I was locked up in some juvenile detention center before heading to an adult prison when I was old enough to be transferred. I stayed put while it rained on me for like two straight hours, getting completely soaked until my school uniform was wringing wet. I tried to hold out for as long as possible, but I knew I couldn't just stay there. I was soaking, hungry and totally unprepared to sleep in a bush overnight. I had to face the music sooner or later, so I chose sooner. And when I finally got home, I saw the police car parked up on the pavement outside my parents' house. So with tears in my eyes, I walked up to the front door and rang the doorbell. My mom answered the door. I was scared she'd be angry, but... She wasn't, or at least that wasn't her immediate reaction. She seemed cold, like emotionally and physically withdrawn for me, something I'd never seen in her before, and that was by far the worst part of it. In the moment, it seemed to me that she'd accepted that her son was a murderer, 
and that she was ready for the police officers in my house to take me away. But the reality of the situation was much more complicated than that. Mom told me to go into the kitchen where my dad and a pair of policemen were waiting for me. There, they explained that they understood that there had been some kind of fight on the school playground, one in which another child had been hurt badly. They also heard that I was one of the two involved. I just broke down and told them everything. Told them I didn't mean to kill the former champion, how I was just trying to hurt him like he was hurting me, and how I was well and truly sorry for everything I'd done. But when I wiped my eyes and looked up at the three of them, they looked terribly confused, and I'll never forget the pure relief I felt when one of the policemen told me that the former champion wasn't dead at all, that he was actually been discharged from the hospital not long before with nothing but stitches and a concussion. I was so relieved that I just burst into tears. In the end, it turned out that the former champion's parents didn't want to press charges. It was something of a minor miracle, but they understood that it was nothing but a playground fight that happened to go very, very wrong. Besides, they probably knew that if I was charged, their own son would be in some capacity too. But that didn't mean the school wouldn't go forward with disciplinary proceedings and extremely harsh ones at that. And that's how I got myself expelled from St. Margaret's C of E High School. But honestly, it wasn't the worst thing in the world to happen to me. I didn't want to go back to that place where I thought I'd committed murder. And although it hurt leaving my friends behind, I did end up making some new ones at the other school I ended up going to. But no matter how hard I tried to distance myself from the horrors of that day, Every autumn, when the conkers start to fall, I still think of the look in the kid's eyes, seeing the whites of them, like I was watching his soul leaving his body. And thank God that he lived. Years ago, back when I was about eight or nine, my folks and I lived in this huge, weird old house that was like right on the edge of this small town in rural Pennsylvania. The local school districts also happened to be in the middle of this big restructuring, so even though me and my little brother were only a couple of grades apart, we went to different schools and took different buses. This meant that I was the last person to leave the house every morning, but also the first person to get home every afternoon since my school was much closer than his but this also meant that it was also my job to make sure all the lights were off and all the doors were locked when I left every morning to head off to school. So this one morning I cottoned on to the fact that the light was on in the basement and also the door was open, so before I left I saw to it that the light was off and the door was locked. Then later when I got home that afternoon I saw that the light was on and the door was open again. I remember thinking I was losing my mind or something and that I totally just imagined locking up. I mean, I was pretty tired most mornings after staying up late playing Overwatch, so it wasn't out of the question that I'd just forgotten to do so. So I went over to turn off the light and close the door. But when I got to the top of the basement staircase, I looked down to see there was a big, shadowy male figure standing at the bottom. I just wig out, slam the door, and push a cabinet against it, then bolt to hide upstairs in my room. For months, I didn't tell my family because I was positive what I had seen was a ghost and didn't think anyone would believe me. A little explanation, it was Halloween time frame, I was young and dumb and happened to have fostered a firm belief in the paranormal. And then about six months after that weird little incident, my mom and dad realized that things had been going missing around the house. They blamed me and my brother at first, but after we insisted that we were innocent, we all walked around the place with flashlights trying to figure out how anyone might have gotten inside without actually breaking in. Turns out, the thing I'd seen in the basement was an actual dude, and he'd been climbing in through a small hole on the outside of the house, worming his way through a crawl space, then coming up into the house through the basement. Recognizing I had been alone in the house with him on at least one occasion was one of the worst, most terrifying realizations I've ever had in my entire life. Needless to say, I don't believe in ghosts anymore. Hey friends, thanks for listening. 
Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, there's no static on Mars.